Welcome. I am the real Dr. Phil, a.k.a. Pastor Phil, a.k.a. The Chief. Welcome to the Dirty Dozen Conference. And why do I call it the Dirty Dozen Conference? Because, man, we get down and dirty talking about the work of God. There's nothing messier than working with human beings. Man, we're the most dangerous species on planet Earth. Every four-footed beast, creeping, crawling thing. I mean, we're all of the above. So that's why we call it the Dirty Dozen Conference. And I picked the 12 most interesting people in the world. Maybe you wonder why you weren't chosen. Maybe you'd be number 13. Get ready. I want to introduce you to my special guest today. My dear friend, I love this guy, man. He is the best of the best. Better than all the rest. My friend, I call him Dr. Richie. Hey, brother. Thank you for having me, bro. Man. I really appreciate it. Good to have you. I know you're fresh in from Boston, New York City, traveling around the world and all that kind of stuff. Take a few minutes. There's some people out there that don't know you from the Chopping Block episodes or from the Set Free Family and all that kind of stuff. So take three, four, five minutes like that. And just tell us a little overview about who you are and what you're doing here with me. Well, um, we go back a long ways. But basically, I grew up in Southern California um, in the 70s, sex, drugs, rock and roll, um, didn't really care about learning. And then I was failing out on my classes and realized, dude, I'm about to graduate. I've got to think about my future. Yeah, I would have loved to have been a rock star or an actor, but there wasn't a lot of, I wasn't talented. So I'm like, mm -hmm. let me go to school. I was interested in the subject matter of psychology and I started studying and I'm like, at least they can't take your degrees away. And so I got deep into it and I was in college for 17 years, got a bachelor's, Ooh. two masters, a PhD in clinical psychology. And that was in 99. <laughs> and I've been working in the field since with addicts, with men who batter, with sex offenders. Me and my partner, now my fiance, she's also a therapist. We do conjoint couples counseling. I call it progressive conjoint couples counseling. And it's a couple who are mental health professionals working with another couple. So it's not that lopsided thing. And so um, I supervise a bunch of interns, like 25 mental health professionals that are new in the game. And then I'm a program director at a small facility. She's, you know, involved with that. And we have a little private practice and I'm just loving it, man. I have two kids, an 18 year old, almost 19, little Richie and my daughter, Angel, who's 20, who you married. Yes. And you baptized both my kids and you Beautiful. baptized me in Ooh, Venice. And, all right. You know, we met in Venice in like the 90s and then we came together in 2012 real hardcore start BTC and a good eight year run of every day. And so in that time period, I grew up with like the most Christ-like father in the world who came from a Jewish family who was atheist and he's 82, he's in great shape, great dude. So I kind of came up thinking the God thing was BS. And then um, because of addiction and AA and NA and CA, I knew I had to open up my mind to some sort of concept of a higher power. God was a term that was repugnant to me, but higher power, okay, I knew I wasn't the highest power. I wasn't that egotistical. So, um, you know, and a 25 year journey from that point to the point where I came to believe and accepted, answered the knock on the door of my heart. And you were instrumental in that. In fact, I was working with you. So it was um, on my motorcycle on the way to work. You know, I think like a year before I had been hit in that same spot and I just kept getting it. And my whole thing was I was never going to raise my hand on peer pressure or just get with the flow because I was surrounded around a lot of believers, a lot of Christians, and I just couldn't like do that thing. So, right. you know, your wife, Sandra, had turned me on to some cool literature like um, More Than a Carpenter from Josh McDowell. And it talks about, you know, um, Jesus was either the Lord, a liar or a lunatic and just some compelling things. Your son, MJ, hit me with some cool books. You turned me on to a tremendous amount of information. We'd go up at a retreat and you'd break down the whole story, Joseph, the whole enchilada. In, in terminology, I could understand. And so eventually I came to believe and that was November 4th, 2014. So that was been like six years ago. So we met back at Venice Beach, I think. Is that the first time we met? Yeah, like 91-ish. Okay, and you were over there lifting weights over there and I saw some people point you out I, and I asked the question, who is that guy over there? You know, all tatted down, all muscly and all that kind of stuff. And they go, that's Dr. Ritchie. And my first thought when they said, Dr. Ritchie, I figured you're a dope doctor, a drug doctor. I had no idea you're this highly educated individual who's a therapist, got his PhD, master's and all this other kind of stuff. So our first meeting, it was kind of interesting. And then we started, uh, we're both from the biker world. 
So yeah. we started bumping into each other. Sure. And before you know it, uh, then you came to work for me at Broadway Treatment Center where uh, we, we work uh, helping addicts out. And uh, that was the beginning of our journey, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And here we are, like I says, man, all these years later, 30 years later, you know, together sharing. And to me, you are truly one of the most inspirational and definitely one of the most interesting people that I know. And I was excited for this interview. Let me ask you a few questions right now. We're going through this thing, this pandemic. We're going through this COVID-19. In this last six months, who would have thought 2020 was going to be like this? Man, when we began this year having a New Year's resolution, 2020 is going to be the bomb, this, that. Yep. Nobody, I would have never, and I'm an old school guy, so I've been through all kinds of the Y2Ks, you know. Mm -hmm. I've been through the 9-11 you know, bombings and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. I've been mm -hmm. through a lot of stuff, then hurricanes, this, Rodney stuff like King, that. Rodney King, riots, all that, yeah. But nothing like this where where it's like, to me, God just pumped the brakes and had the whole world stop. Yes. Imagine, I remember that old song, uh, uh, God's got the whole world in his hands. Yep. He really does yep. have the whole world. And he is, boom. What are you thinking and how has this changed, affected, helped your life, this whole pandemic situation? Well, um, growing up, I was a hardcore extrovert and I was always out. Like from the age of about 13 or 14 till probably 31, 33, I was out at clubs, at punk rock shows, at bars, um, in the mix, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And so at about like 33, I started mellowing out. I was getting my doctorate, um, had started having a family and I just didn't want to be out there anymore so much. And so everything ended up changing for me. Like my whole view, like I realized I was upside down, living in an upside down world, thinking I was right side up. Mm. And as time went on, I realized I was upside down and I started to get more right side up a little bit in the process of sanctification and really realized this world is effed up and it's cool. It's just the way that it is. And so um, just started, you know, having a different perspective. So my partner and I have been together a few years and, you know, we work a lot. We're busy. Some of it's Zoom, some of it's other video conferencing, telemedicine, some of it's in vivo. And um, we have my little family, like my kids, and then we have her family. It's a huge Mexican family. And everybody's good with each other. Everybody loves each other. I'm not hyper paranoid about it. Like I'm kind of middle of the road. Like I don't think it's a complete conspiracy and all that stuff, but I do believe like the communist Chinese party manufactured it. Right. And I believe they probably did HIV. And I believe that 9-11 was, you know, manufactured by us and probably the Israeli Mossad. And that's just my beliefs. I don't know a lot about political stuff, but I'm very cynical in terms of not trusting anything I hear on the news or from anybody, any book I know is somewhere between zero and hundred percent true and usually more closer to zero. Fortunately, I'm okay with uncertainty and I'm not a voracious studier of politics and all this stuff. So it doesn't really pertain to me that much. I don't trip, but I care about people's health. So I don't want to go in there with a flag and just be coughing on everybody. So I respect it. I go with the flow on it, but I'm not paranoid either. But tomorrow there's a funeral of a brother who died from COVID. So I know it's a real thing. Maybe, you know, the left is overblowing it and the right, you know, things are so polarized and it's so sad because it's like we could, we should talk about issues, not like right or left. And, and people are, get so butthurt. It's hard for a lot of people to have a mature adult discussion yeah, where they disagree. Exactly. And I could talk about any subject, sex, religion, um, politics, and have someone who has the diametrically opposed perspective and just be in a cool, calm and collected discussion. And I'll learn something from them. And it might change my view a little bit. It might not. Maybe they'll learn something from me. So. I never even heard the word pandemic before, you know? <laughs> and then there's Dr. Fauci, you know, I mean, this fellow comes on the scene. And so that's the first time I've seen such a polarization in science versus, well, how I feel or what I think. And I was sharing with some of my uh, friends the other day. I says, we want to believe the science about it is a virus, that this will happen, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, these scientists, I point out to them, uh, you know, they believe that this world is millions, if not billions of years old. They have a different viewpoint than a creationist who believes the Bible and believes that chronologically speaking, you know, it's probably 6,000 years old. So different views, but 
I'm like you, like I says, hey, let's talk about it. Let's agreeably disagree. So the pandemic, has it changed anything else in your personal life? Um, not really. It's, it hasn't really affected my life. It's kind of almost been like a breath of fresh air. The one area that has been very detrimental to me is the gym's closing because I'm an avid weight trainer. That's what I do for my mental health and to stay in shape. I'm 55 this year, so I'm getting to be an older man and it's hard to stay in shape. And I've been working out since age 17. So we have in our loft, there's a little gym up there and we can do it, but it just doesn't have the weights that I want and all the things. So I can like hit my whole body and hit it hard and stuff like that. So that's been a bummer, but these are first world problems. You know, I'll bitch and moan about, oh no, I've got to sign all these things. And then there's people like starving and can't even get clean water. And I'm just bitching about my, that I have to document something, you know? Oh, so I hear you. it's I easy hear you. to get, you know, be complaining about stuff, but really in actuality, I'm very grateful. I'm blessed. I'm not in jail. I'm not in prison. I still got my eyesight. It's not as good as it used to be, but I've got great friends. My kids are doing great. They never got into drugs. They never got into gangs. And, you know, it's just, I'm so blessed. I have a beautiful, wonderful, intelligent, supportive, significant other that accepted my proposal for marriage. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Beautiful. Beautiful. So I'm stoked, man. And she's my best friend and we're in the same field and we work together and she helps me a lot. You know, it's probably, I'm, I'm definitely getting the better end of the deal than she is. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> but hey, brother. God so, bless you, brother, and all that. Now, you. let's, let's just for a moment, okay? I know maybe you may not be into it too much, but you got any political views? You have any thoughts about these, you know, uh, the Joe Biden and uh, Donald Trump? Do you have any thoughts? Uh, do you vote any of that kind of I stuff? Really, I really, I voted when I turned 18 and I did that for a bunch of years, but then now I've come to believe that it's the illusion of, of choice and that it's really the same thing. It's the same machine. Now, in terms of me being a mental health professional, it's about conduct. So I don't know how they vote. I don't know what they're really doing, so I can't speak to that. But if we look at Barack Obama, for example, versus um, Donald Trump, Barack Obama was an eloquent speaker. I love how he carried himself. I love how he represented the United States of America. And just a, uh, like he was open about Classic, using yeah. drugs, mm -hmm. knew how to act, good looking dude, you know, and then with Trump, I don't know him, so I don't like to really put people down, but just talking shit about people a lot and kind of cantankerous. And, you know, he'll go to other countries and, and refuse to shake the hand of another diplomat there. And like, he's representing all of America. So I wish he would represent it in more of a way that's coming from a loving perspective, because I'm about cooperation, not competition. I'm about love, not war. Now I realize sometimes you gotta go to war, you know, but I'm gonna always, come in a in a diplomatic positive way at first you know and then a last resort is war a last resort is violence unless there's a, a real threat to me and or my family or loved ones there's no need and it rarely comes to me so i just love life i love people and mm. i'm not tripping what do you think of when they talk about defunding the police how does that uh, ring a bell in your head? Well, personally, I don't utilize the services of the police personally, as you know, in our <laughs> lifestyle. But I think a society without a police force would be pandemonium and anarchy, and it would just be crazy. So I just think that the police, you know, um, in general, it needs to be, they need to have a little bit more of some empathy because you've got so many people out there. We live in downtown. When you hear someone yelling nine times out of 10, they're not yelling at anybody else. They're schizophrenic, they're tripping out. So, and then another dude's like, hey, are you yelling at me? And then they get in a fight. It's like, dude, it's wow. not necessary. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We got people shooting in their necks. We've got people with no shoes. We got dogs that all have shoes. You're downtown LA. Downtown, man. Cause my lady's getting her doctorate in the Chicago School of Professional Psych. So I'm in the mix, I dig it. I've always loved being in the mix. I've been from Venice to Hollywood, to East LA, to all over the place in um, Cali. And you know, that was my stomping grounds, Venice. And that's where we crossed paths. So, you know, um, the political thing, you know, I liked Jimmy Carter. Like people will talk shit on Jimmy Carter. I liked, he was a humanitarian. Um, even though I wasn't a believer back then, he was a believer. And so I just like people that are for harmony and to bring positive. I believe everything can be a win-win situation. Right. I don't think for me to come up, I've got to step on your toes. And I think we could always have it be a positive interaction. And I know not all the world's like that. And we have to vet people and you can't trust everybody, but I'm a pretty trusting cat. And I don't really put myself in a position to be, 
you know, um, victimized too much. But the political thing is above and beyond me because since I don't study it and I'm not very well informed, I can't really speak on it righteously because I don't know how they're voting or what they're really doing. The things they tell us, I don't believe. I don't believe anything that I hear, pretty much. You would know you be saying? willing to run for a local office or anything like that? I think that would be cool. You yeah. know, I would. Um, but the thing is, is and just like you, I'd put myself on front street and, hey, this is all the bad stuff about me. Um, it, it's like there was a while where you and I, um, you were thinking about having grooming me as an assistant pastor. And it was really exciting. But you know what? I wasn't ready then, bro. And I'm getting more ready for that type of thing. Ooh, I like that. But I just wasn't ready and everything in God's timing. So I didn't want to jump the gun. Things happened as they were supposed to. We were supposed to go to Israel back in the days and then they were warring. So the trip got put on hold. I still want to go to Israel, Me be too. dipped in the Jordan. Yes. You know, bro, I want to go to Cuba. I want to travel the world. I want to have fun. Like you said in the beginning of this interview, I've been jet setting around and, and that's what it's about. I want to have travel and my vocation intermix. So it's paying for itself, and I'm able to help people, help myself, have a great life with my uh, soon-to-be wife, uh, and I, just yeah. do it. I love that. And he, so here we are now. We you know, talked a little about the pandemic, a little bit about politics and stuff like that. Let's talk about relationships a little bit, because uh, you know me pretty well, and uh, most people that know me, I give this kind of unsolicited <laughs> advice now. I tell people, <laughs> don't get married and don't have children. Although I just celebrated 43 years of marriage, I've got five grown children and 23 grandchildren, but I let people know, well, uh, nobody, I didn't take anybody's advice in the day and everything like that. Uh, what's, what's your advice on relationships, especially now you're newly engaged, you're going to be married soon, you're, you're happy, she's your best friend. I mean, you got it going on. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, what brother. would you say to people about relationships? I think your um, general unsolicited advice is on point. You know, if to when you get involved in a relationship, it's going to make life harder. It's like pouring miracle grow on your character defects. It's a mirror to you. After the honeymoon period, that person becomes a mirror to all your shortcomings and your character flaws, and it's painful. And so you can battle that other person, or you can utilize that information to try to grow and be a better person. And it's challenging. And, you know, change is the one constant in life. And most of us resist change. The only thing that never changes is God. And so trying to be flexible and go with the flow and learn. I've learned a lot from this woman. Uh, it, she makes me want to be a better man. Um, earlier mm. points in my life, I wouldn't have been suitable to be her man because she is a higher caliber woman than how I had conducted myself. You know, she's, she's raised the bar for you. Yeah, definitely. She has integrity. She treats herself with respect. I was a whore and a drug abuser and um, an adrenaline junkie. And I had a lot of fun and I didn't want to hurt anybody, but I didn't realize that I probably wasn't adding to these people spiritually. And now that I've grown to a degree and I'm still a baby, dude, there's still a lot of room for growth that I just, I want to add to people. So my whole view has changed, you know, back in the days, like with my grandparents who were married, they were friends and then got married and were only with each other. When I grew up, I thought, man, that sucks. You can't, you know, test the waters and all that. And then now, since I tested the waters for, you know, 30 years or whatever, I really respect people who get with their high school sweetheart, like wow, my daughter. Yes. And you don't need to be, it doesn't help you to add to you to be with a bunch of people. Pornography, I think is something that's destructive. And I'm not coming from like a, a Christian perspective of morality per se, that when a man pairs pornography and sex and lust, by the time you start having loving feelings for a woman, love and sex have nothing to do with each other. And so the way that our culture was, at least when I was being raised and probably a lot for you too, it was about being a stud and going out there and knocking, you know, knocking it down. And then the double standard of if women are too uh, liberal with themselves and their sluts or whatever. So, you know, I've really just, I've, I don't watch pornography anymore, you know, since I got with her. It wasn't like I was addicted, but I would still utilize it, but it didn't help me. Boy, it, it's damaging. She, she has been a great influence on your peace of mind in life. I use you as an illustration almost daily because in our business, this rehab business, there's rehab love going on all the time. And I've learned that I learned the truth many, many decades ago about as a man or woman thinketh, so are they. So I used to watch you when new clients would come in 
and you take this long one, two, three day psychological evaluation on a person, I'm going, man, I just read them in five minutes, man, up, down, whatever, like I said. But I was thinking how important that is. And I've given counsel to people, I says, listen, get to know what they're all about in here, what kind of person they're all about. Because that hour is all cute, nice, sweet, and everything like that. But until you get to know that person, until you've been with them through a, you know, winter, a summer, and fall, right. and all the seasons, thing like that. So I'm always saying, hey, I'll send you to Dr. Richie. He'll give you a psychological evaluation. So you've been able to do your own psych evaluation with your lady and her with you. Yeah. Both of you have studied the psyche and all that kind of good stuff and uh, got to come to an educated view of how the two of you work out. So relationships, that's a cool thing. Let's talk about this for a minute here. Let's talk about spirituality, okay? Yes. That's a different thing to a lot of different people in this world. Mm -hmm. What? How do you see that that word, the term, the application of spirituality in your life and how you speak to others? That's an excellent question, man. Um, to me, the most simple way to break down the essence of what God is, is three words, God is love. Now, the deceiver wants to divide and to attempt to conquer. So we've got all these split offs of J dubs and, you know, Baptist and, you know, Lutheran and all this stuff. And it's like getting caught up on the minutia, like the whole thing of swallowing a, a gnat to strain a camel or whatever, you know, yes. I'm always paraphrasing. So to me, it's about the red letters of what Jesus was saying, man, treat people with respect. Don't be judgmental of others, protest your own sin, try to improve, realize we're never going to be good enough. Our greatest attributes are filthy rags to the most high. And thank God when we come to believe our belief system is we got something we could have never earned, never worked towards. And I mean, we could work towards trying to become more Christ-like, but, but salvation. And, um, it's like, it's, it's something that, um, it humbles you. You know, because like you always say, you're either going to be humble or you're going to be humbled. One or the and other, pride right? goes before the fall. Yes. You know, so like when you're 13 and 15, you know everything. And then you become 46 and you realize you don't know shiznit, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. And so it's been a blessing, bro. Um, so I'm a believer. I don't like going around saying I'm Christian because also like I use cuss words and stuff, no, not with hate in my heart. And it's more of punctuation. And some people can say, oh, that's a justification. And I'm fine with that, <laughs> you know, and I'm very far from being perfect. But um, it's all about just, you know, being grateful to God. If I'm complaining and moping about the problems, I'm praising the deceiver. So for me, and you taught me this, I would wake up every morning and my first thought was F. I remember I don't want to I, get I'm thinking of the exactly the same thing. So here you are now in your life, and uh, and what words, affirmations, verses, uh, sayings, what are the things you speak to yourself to get your motor running every day, to make it the best day, the most productive day? What, what, how do you talk to yourself? After the automatic initial thought and feeling of F, I don't want to deal with the world, I say, God, thank you for this day. This is the day you have made. I'll be glad. I will rejoice in it. And it's not like a lightning bolt of joy hits me, but it allows me to start the ball rolling the other way. I start going through a gratitude list of once again, I'm not in jail. I'm not in prison. My kids are okay. I've got my eyesight. It's not World War III. I'm in a wonderful relationship. I've got a great career. Like I really am blessed. I've got so many people that love me and support me. I don't have really enemies and stuff like that on a personal level. And so I'm just blessed, man. I'm just blessed. And um, I just want to, you know, carry positivity. You know, I don't want to be the judging people and talking bad about people because it's like, for what? The first thing a fool does is seek to reform others. And the first thing a wise man does is seek to reform self. I've got a lot of work to do on self before I'm in a position to start pointing fingers, you know, but I'm in a profession where I'm there to help. And I've been in school for 30 years, you know, and have been in the field 30 years. And so the thing is, I learned a lot. Now, one of the initial work populations that I work with were men who got busted for domestic violence. And that was a blessing because prior to that, I was working with victims of violent crime and I really felt compassion for these women. But then they're like, hey, I had long blonde hair. I was like a surfer stoner. I was like 21 going to SC. 
and then go to Cal State, Cal State LA. And then they're like, hey, you're a good guy. Why don't we have you working with these dudes who get busted for domestic violence? Mm. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a good guy. And then so I start doing this work and within like three weeks, I get depressed and I wanna abandon this line of work because I'm noting the commonalities. Yeah, I wasn't a hardcore batter. I was not a control freak. I was never wanting to be violent or hurtful to a woman. But in looking at 10 different tactics of power and control or abusive behavior, I was able to recognize I've done a lot of effed up stuff. And so I'm trying to, I was, that was a saving grace in a lot of ways. Now, even though for years I knew that information and I was promoting, I was an anti-violence educator as it pertains to intimate relationships with men. And that was a lifesaver, but I still was not perfect along the way. And all the mistakes I've made, which have been plenty, have led me to this point. And I still make mistakes and I've still made mistakes in the two years we've been together, but it's helped me to be able to not damage this relationship irreparably as I did in the past. Right. And so I'm grateful for those past transgressions and lessons learned because when you make a mistake and it hits you hard and that pride goes and that you get humbled, it sticks with you. And so it's been a blessing in that way. Wow. You know, you know uh, earlier I mentioned how I picked the 12 most interesting people to me. We all have our own list of that, but I tell people, you know, when uh, to keep my passion, to keep my excitement about life and service to others, to be a blessing to God, my family and friends, I've got to be surrounded. Everybody knows it takes a village to raise a child. Everybody knows it's we are who we hang out with. So I love being able to tell stories of my most interesting friends. And when I talk about you, I always talk about, you know, how we met, the things that happened. But we always had kind of like, uh, hey, yeah, I like you, you know, vibe right from the get-go, yeah, well, you know, because there's certain people that we just team up yeah. with, you know, it's just a, man, you know, he gets me, I get him, and it's never been a putting each other down, it's always been, you know, what can I do for you, help you out, you know, you helped me out when I was starting out in this business, treatment business, you, you knew all the psychobabble and all that stuff, and I knew how to just get a bunch of characters around that needed help. And so you've helped me grow. You've helped me mature in my way as far as education. You've got other people excited and, and people really look up to you, you know, and that's an important thing. And, and your spirituality, it was one of those things, uh, you know, the Bible says to become all things to all people that we might win some to Christ. And, uh, you know, I didn't come trying to beat you over the head with a Bible or anything like that. I just loved you right where you're at. And uh, we got along great. And so often today, people are trying to shove something down somebody's throat. That's why during this pandemic times, especially where there's no church services, man, I'm having church every day of the week. Wherever two or three gather in his name, we're having church. I've got the other youngsters that hang out here doing Bible studies. They're talking about God, the time, when's he coming back? How long has it been? This, that, and I'm going, man. And now in my life, I'm, I'm blessed like you, man. I got the woman I want to be with. She's my number one soldier, my best friend. I live, I, live, I live right where I want to live, right here in the middle of the hood, you know. But it's cool because this property is just dedicated to a, it's a venue. I tell people, you know, it isn't a place I go sit out by the pool, man. It's a venue. People come over. And things that I thought were weird, and maybe you didn't, like I said, but I can remember the first time I heard somebody tell me, Doc, uh, man, I had a stimulating conversation with that person. I go, <laughs> what's a stimulating conversation? And then I heard, I'd hear people tell me, I, I just want to cuddle up with a book. What do you mean cuddle up with a book? Now I teach leadership groups, mm -hmm. you know, that everything rises and falls on leadership. And I just love studying. And I love the light to be going on and all those things like that. But iron sharpening iron, so yeah. does the brother sharpen the countenance of another brother or sister. So here we are. Yes. One of the reasons I picked you to be one of the 12 is because all of the 12 on this panel, this virtual panel, not this inboxes Zoom panel, but this virtual world, we're, real, we're really here. Let me yes. touch you right. Yes, we're brother. really here yeah. on camera, you know uh -huh. what I mean? Is, is because everybody's on a journey and it's a Mount Everest of some sort they're all going for. None of my 12, <clears throat> excuse me, none of my 12 are people just laying around kicking back at the beach doing nothing. That's not my crowd. That's not my crowd. They're my crowd to pull up and try to get something, go put a fire underneath their yeah. ass, get them going alive. But they're all doing something. Tell me your short-range goals, mid-range goals, and long-range goals, because I know you're shooting for the stars, my friend. That's cool. 
Um, I've got a lot of goals. Um, I want to try to um, get more organized right now and get things flowing. When you're in a transition in your career to trying to take it to the next level, like it's easy to do a lateral move. It's real easy to stay stuck where you're at. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm in a great place. I've been doing great work, but I really want to take it to the next level, which is writing films, writing books, being in films, be, doing media psychology, speaking at universities, traveling the world with my lady at conferences. And that's really what turns me on. You know what I'm saying? Woo! Now that's a mouthful right there because immediately I started thinking of, you know, uh, my friends here, you know, are shooting us right now. Like I said, uh, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, you know, time flies when you're having fun. But I mentioned, uh, man, I want to do a 15 minute film. When I say I want to do it, I want my friends to do it, actually. Yeah, yeah. I just got an idea. I'd like to see it happen. I'm the executive producer. Right. Okay, you know, I want to do it. So they they wrote a screenplay already the last two weeks. They're going to be shooting that. I had another guy come by who I, I went to go up and see in, um, in the media capital of the world, Burbank today, you know, who's shooting a, a couple films right now. That whole thing, because I know how social media works on that, you know, that you're able to speak to the world. And especially, <laughs> man... Before this pandemic, I never sat down to watch Netflix. Now, man, I've seen everything on Netflix now, That's you know, cool. because even on my time schedule, it has me. I used to be out till midnight. Now, uh, even any place I want to go through a drive through is closed at 9 o'clock usually. So I'm over here with my wife watching Netflix, some type of thing like that. But that you want to do that. It's exciting, you know, and, 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 and the, the little traveling here and doing those things. And the two of you, the first thing that came to my mind, the two of you are a power couple. You've heard that saying before. That's why when people divorce, it's divided force. Yes. But when you're together, it's a power couple. I, when I say I'm going to do something, my wife's the detailed person in my life, making sure I'm up, make sure I take my meds, make sure I do this, you know, takes care of her man, you know, all those little details that I need in my life. But you guys are a power couple. I mean, uh, a lot of times people say... Uh, Two people live, you know, it's 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 half the price. No, it's twice as much, yep. but you get twice as much what you put in for. And the good book, the Bible said, it's not good for man to be alone. Yes. That's God's words. Yep. And it says that he that finds a wife finds a what? A, a good, good thing. thing. A good a thing. Good so thing. you got a good thing. You got here, the two of you together. Uh, we need somebody to be able to speak into our life. We don't need a bunch of yes people that just go, yeah, whatever you want to do. That, you know, that's just one simple unit here. Here, you got a collaboration. you got a mastermind in between the For two sure. of you. Two of you educated, seeing things, you know, not just to like, but able to complement one another. And yeah. they become more than words. You know me, I used to run. I used to have my soldiers, my boys, my this, my that, do I do that and stuff like that. I thought they were my, my real soldiers at one time until I came to a place of understanding and realized my number one soldier is my wife, yes. best friend, and she's got my back above all. She's the most downest of them oh, all. She's downer, more badass than all of them yeah. put together. But at the time, like that, that's how we learn and grow. I'm a, I'm a slow learner. I'm a late bloomer. Yeah, me too. But I realize God saves the best wine for last. So here you got yeah. your little short range. How about mid range goals? Well, that I don't know how short. I don't know where that fits in with short, mid, or long, in terms of the timing. So. Really, like right now, I'm just trying to be on top of all my responsibilities because I want to fulfill my obligations and the people that I work with, I want them to feel like I'm handling business, but I'm stretched really thin. So it's tough when you're doing a lot of different things because it might give the appearance that it's a half-assed thing at each place. So once again, Sandri is a great source of support and she's my backbone and she helps out a lot with organizing because... In terms of being 55 and technology, like, dude, I hate phones. I hate emails. I hate texts. I hate, you know, and I don't hate many things. I'm a lover. You know what I'm saying? But, but it just confuses me because I'm like, like old school, like actual paper, you know, books, you know? And so it gets confusing and I know there's a good side to it and there's a bad side to it. But one thing that you had mentioned something about friends and stuff like that and you know, it's amazing. And then the whole thing of like, tomorrow's not promised. So I have these short, long, mid and long-term goals, but you know, tomorrow I could be gone or whatever. And Hey, it is what it is. And it was like our friend Liam had a lot of big plans, doing big things. He had done a lot of big things, the coolest dude in the world. And then boom, he passes away and that's life. And now according to his beliefs, and hopefully it's true what we believe 
that he's in paradise, you know? And, um, but it's just a trippy thing, you know? So the other thing that I want to mention, if it's possible, because all this stuff with like separation and like the racial and the stuff like this, and then the Christian community, a lot of times, I think in America, maybe worldwide is real, like anti-homosexual sometimes. And so my whole thing is this, I'm a mental health professional too. And I might have people that are transgender, that are gay, that are lesbians, that are of all different walks of life. And so my thing is this, sin means misses the mark, right? And so that doesn't mean necessarily evil. It just means it deviates from perfection. Mm -hmm. So when um, Adam and Eve messed up, and from that point forward, everybody was born in original sin. We're all flawed to some degree or another. That's right. And there is none righteous, no, not one, except the one Christ. 100% man, 100% God. So, like, I think there's a little too hardcore of focus against homosexuality because as far as I know, and I'm not a complete expert on the Bible, but it's mentioned maybe three or four times more in the Old Testament. It's always linked with sexual immorality. And I know people that have been with their husband two dudes that have been together 30 years and they love each other. They have a harmonious relationship. And so I don't, you know, any sort of hate towards that. I mean, I'm a hundred percent heterosexual thinking about male homosexual conduct is repugnant to me, but that's just because I'm straight, but everybody's different. You know what I'm saying? So if it's two women, if it's two men, like I just want to put it out there that I think that we need to embrace differences, not promote people doing all sorts of stuff, but just, Live and let live and let people be who they are and stop trying to, you know, protest your own sin. I'm not going to protest homosexuality when I was a womanizer. I need to protest being a womanizer. You know, so that's just my little thing I want to put out there. African, black American people, um, Latinos, you know, every group, cops even. Like when the whole thing and everyone's hating on the cops. Yeah, I've my biggest prejudice throughout my life has been cops because they manhandled me when I was young. But I was riding my motorcycle on the dirt trails and I was ditching them and doing all sorts of stuff. So, I mean, they're people too. So I just like think everybody is a human being trying to get through their day. Most people are good people. Every government is corrupt. And that's just pretty much how I see things. You know what I'm saying, bro? So I want to slip that in. And I'm glad you slipped that in because, you know, I have people, uh, part of my uh, dirty dozen, who don't even want to talk about politics because if they dare say Trump, you got the haters over here. If they say Biden, you got the other haters over here. And yet we're all, all 12, all of us dirty dozen, interesting people, the most interesting people in the world. We all love God. Yeah. You know, we're all in a different perspective. I think the way I'm looking at things is, is the best perspective because I've been down the road of life the longest, but that doesn't mean it is the best. The word of God's of the final rule for my faith and practice. And I'm on a roll. My last wake up call was 12 years ago when I was busted. And he put in jail for on a million dollar bail for attempted murder and a whole bunch of other stuff, like I said. That. But these last 12 years have been the best years of my life. I am living the high life in Jesus like never before. But not many people are going to talk about Trump. I don't see in California people with Trump stickers on their car or flags. <laughs> They're going to get flogged. You know, it's a terrible thing. And that's the same thing. I'm glad you brought that out about homosexual people, transgender people, and things like that. Hey, uh, but it could be your daughter, your son, or family member. So get ready for it. That thing that we said we'd never do or we're against, watch out. I'm not per- like, and you put it just perfect. I'm not promoting something like that, but you know what? Man, I, I think it, Jesus forgave all sin. All. And, you know, that's why, you know, about 10 years ago, you remember when I decided to become a professional forgiver. Yes, I do. Some people want to be a professional golfer, some people a mm-hmm. professional server. I chose to be a professional forgiver. Little did I know what I was praying for, brother, because <laughs> that's what you want to be. That's what God's going to test you, because it's easier to take a view with something or easy to dream about something. But to put it into practice, God has brought people into my life, man, who are, man, I wanted to kill. And he just, I want you to love them. I want you to pray for them. Matter of fact, I want you to take them out for dinner tonight, and you pay. <laughs> and he's done all those things. And you're I like, mean, dude. Every time I get a little stomach ache about looking at somebody and having a resentment or something like that, God just... Oh, you know, I'm like the Apostle Paul where the Apostle Paul said, Lord, can you remove uh, this thing from me? Can you remove that? Can you get rid of this? You know, and and he told Paul, no, you know, yeah, my grace you is need sufficient. that thorn in your side. I need that thorn. Like I said, and I tell people I live a life where, man, I move straight ahead. It's easy to move to the left. I don't know. I move straight ahead by the grace of God. But that's because I bumped my head so many times. 
and, and I've fallen off. I'm like Humpty Dumpty over and over again, you know, and it had to be God put me back together. So, and we're on the same. I'm glad yeah. you brought that up, you know, because it's um, protest our own sin. Oh, that hurts. Man, you know, that's why I said when people come and talk about her, you did this, do that. And I go, I'm glad you didn't hear about some other stuff. I did. <laughs> so what else would you like to tell the world? Because I'm telling you, my cameraman over here, my media men over here, we want this to be seen around the world. We want it to be the only virtual reality show where people are in person and not in some box somewhere, you know, pretending like they're talking to a person. Here we are eye to eye, face to face. And like I told you a little bit earlier, uh, I, I, I wasn't a hugger. I was a drugger, man. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I was a, not a hope dealer like I am now. I was hopeless. So once I became a hugger, once I, I, I realized that where Jesus said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together unless the COVID come. I never read all that COVID <laughs> stuff. So me, I tell people, hey, I'm, and I've never washed my hands like I have before. I've never tried to do all those things like that. But uh, I'm an essential worker. I'm a frontline worker, you know. I'm working with the, the sick at heart. I'm watching people be depressed and full of anxiety, and I'm not popping pills in their mouth. I'm trying to give them a encouraging word, you know, That's a cool. holy hug, a holy kiss, you know, and to love them. What else would you like to tell the world? Well, I would encourage myself and others, trust the process, have faith. Um, even seemingly bad things later upon reflection, you realize it had to go that way, and God will bring good out of even bad situations. If you're in a loving relationship, be ready for some attacks from the deceiver and don't get caught up into it. Keep one hand in the sky, but also try to keep your feet firmly planted on the ground to deal with all the responsibilities and obligations that we have. But don't take it too serious because it'll just crush us up. Uh, three T's. Things take time. Frustration is the manifestation of unrealistic expectations. So let's look within and see what is my unrealistic expectation that I can readjust instead of wanting to point the finger at this person and that person. Um, and basically like pretty much be cool, treat people with respect. Don't trip. Don't take it personal. Don't trip, live life and just enjoy, man. Hmm. Let me close with this. I'm going to give you a little rapid fire of a few things I think of when I meet somebody. Okay. And then I'd like you to do the same thing with however you want to express yourself. When I first uh, meet somebody, I know the Bible says man looks in the outward, but God looks in the heart. So no matter what you're wearing this or like that, I'm going to look at your heart. When I look at anybody and I, when I meet people new every day, I, I shake their hand. Hey, nice meeting you. Back of my head, I'm going, it was nice knowing you. Yeah. <laughs> Number three thing I think about a time, I consider all people flaky. Okay. Why do I think they're flaky? Is because I spent so much of my life flaky, you know. Whatever I am, you know, that's how I judge people, you know, with the way I am. Like I said, when I hear a lame excuse, I go, I know that excuse because I wrote the book of excuses. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how about you? Do you have any things like that when you meet people, that how you set yourself up? Well, my thing is this. When I meet someone, they're just another person. And I'm, I'm pretty much a lover of people and a lover of life in general. And my lady will kind of clown me for this, but I like to run stories. So... I'll tell them about myself, I'll run my story, and I ask them to run their story, and then there's a bond. There's some level of emotional intimacy because it's not just a person, you know about their life experience, and we've all trudged, we've all had adversity, trials and tribulations, and so that bond makes me feel closer to the person, and um, that's what I dig, you know, that's what I dig. That's, that reminds me of my favorite TV show, like I said, because I'm the old school guy, I used to love the circus, you know? I always want to be the ringmaster, you know? The greatest show on earth. So when I when I think about about people, you know, I realize that uh, man, you know what? Uh, everybody. My favorite TV show is America's Got Talent. It's got all these different acts on there, but 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 better than the acts is the backstory. Yeah. Because if we're willing to listen, you know, be quick to hear but slow to speak, willing to hear somebody's backstory, it'll change the whole relationship that we have them. Because <clears throat> everybody's going through something that we don't know about. It's so true, bro. I'm, I'm an extrovert and I've always have been. And so like when I was younger and living in Hollywood and I'd go to a dive bar and there'd be some old man sitting there and I'd be like, hey bro, can I buy you a beer or whatever? Or a soda or whatever. And then I'd start <coughs> picking his brain. And at first that was just some old man where it's like, throw away the old man, you know? 
And then after I had heard his life story, I'm like, Ooh. dang, man, like almost invariably always. So you got to get to know people. You got to empathize with people. Everybody's going through it, trying to do their best. And um, people, you know, people are cool. You know, there's some people that love people, but don't really like them that much. And I understand that. And then there's some of us who love people. And after I meet someone, me and my lady, I'll be like, man, that person was cool. And she'll be like, you think everybody's cool. And you know what? I do. And the thing is, I'll see the positive. And I got that from my father. But I realize there's people that are doing janky stuff and up to no good. But I just try to (laughs) see the positive. And that's just what I naturally connect with. You know, you know what? Uh, That just you ring so many bells. Like I says, you know, my wife's always going, you always think that person's good. You think they sing good. You think they're good. What? (laughs) You know, you know, I'm two tacos away from happiness. You know, I mean, just uh, Simple. I keep it simple because I'm simple, you know, and it works out for me that way. Well, Dr. Richie, you are one of the most interesting people in the world. Thank you, brother. And uh, you are definitely part of the Dirty Dozen. And you and your lady are doing some great work. And uh, is your podcast coming soon? Yeah, bro. We're going to be through the Magic House doing it big time. And so, yeah, it's going to be coming real soon. So stay tuned for that. You know.